Mass Effect told more than the story of Commander Shepard. It told a story of love, hope, discovery, destruction. But what if I told you an entirety of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies held so many more dark, disturbing, and horrifying secrets? to their destruction. In the end, what they chose to call us is irrelevant. We simply, we impose order on the chaos of organic evolution. You exist because we allow it, and you will end because we demand a beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. Millions of years after your civilization has been eradicated and forgotten, we will endure. For those that don't know, an iceberg is a deep dive into the strangest and most interesting theories on any topic. So today, I wanted to take a look into the Mass Effect universe, one of my favorite science fiction worlds ever, where the first tiers of the iceberg are the more mundane and kind-hearted theories, and as we get deeper into my list, we find the most disturbing, interesting, and obscure conspiracies in all of Mass Effect. Many of the side missions in Mass Effect 1 are boring filler that takes us from one barren planet to another to fight the same enemies in the exact same copy-paste interiors. In a lot of ways, Rogue VI is exactly the same, but the ending has a huge twist that a lot of players don't know about. You see, the mission tasks a player with going to Earth's moon to stop a virtual intelligence that has gone rogue and taken over an Alliance training facility. After taking down the turrets guarding the base, you make your way into the three buildings and fight your way through a barrage of mechs. In each facility, you are tasked with taking down the VI's conduits in order to shut it down. But it is only when destroying the last conduit that you get this message. A burst of white noise over all frequencies nearly deafens you. Your hard suit's heads-up display interprets it as a series of zeros and ones. They repeat again and again blanketing all frequencies, until the lights on the final VI cluster flicker and die. Most players probably stopped here and moved on, but if you actually translate that binary code into ASCII, you get one simple phrase, help. This message relayed to you from the virtual intelligence implies early on in the Mass Effect universe that these machines may be capable of organic thought and emotion. Even the note on the quest tab after completing the mission implies that this artificial intelligence has become sentient. And even further, another scene many players miss in Mass Effect 1 shows us once again a rogue AI on the Citadel in the Finance District that threatens Shepard with blowing up now that it has become sentient. These two moments lead strong credence to the idea that synthetics in the Mass Effect universe are more than just mindless machines, but rather something much, much deeper. Also, fun side note, that VI that you kill on the moon in Mass Effect 1 actually gets revealed in Mass Effect 2 and 3 to be the original start to Edie, who is later taken over by Cerberus and placed on the Normandy SV2. One of the most beloved DLCs of all time, for all of gaming, not just Mass Effect, was the Mass Effect 3 Citadel DLC. It was the final piece of content for the original trilogy and allowed players a last chance to hang out with all of those lovable characters they grew to know over the three games in one laid back and whimsical adventure. The DLC has a much different tone than the rest of the entire series, and while it is a nice change of pace, it also feels a little out of place at times. We meet another clone of Shepard, we share many obscure moments with the characters, and really, in a lot of ways, it just feels too good to be true. And well, that might be because it is. You see, Avena, the virtual intelligence unit on the Citadel that helps Shepard make his way around the complex and all the games, in this DLC specifically has a new line. When asking about Purgatory, the main nightclub on the Citadel, now Avina will start to drone on and on about the Christian conception of purgatory and the afterlife, 
whereas before she would simply speak about the actual nightclub destination. This moment, along with the weird oddities throughout the DLC, strongly imply that the moments we have here may actually be taking place in the afterlife, following the death of Shepard at the end of Mass Effect 3. Replaying the DLC under this context adds a especially spooky tone and can change entirely how you see and play through it. Another small tidbit many players don't know about the release of Mass Effect 2 is that originally Bioware intended to allow players to re recruit any character to your team at any point during the story. Instead, in the final release, what we actually got were two batches of missions for recruiting squad mates, where some characters like Samara only get unlocked after doing the Horizon main mission where you find Ashley Williams. It's interesting to think about what other lines of dialogue and moments we could have seen had we had the chance to take some of these characters on the earlier missions. In fact, for the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, these recorded dialogue scenes and moments were almost added back into the game along with their original design, but it was ultimately decided against. Today, you can experience some of this hidden and forgotten dialogue through modding. For those of you who didn't play Mass Effect Andromeda, one of the more likable squad mates you meet on your journey is a female Turian named Vetra. During some dialogue sequences while driving around planets, we can hear Vetra remark to Drax that she doesn't actually know who her father is. All she gathered from her childhood is that he was a special ops agent who got involved with some shady types before disappearing and leaving the family when she was young. Where this gets interesting though, is when we dig further into Vetra's past, we learn that her mother was actually a high ranking military commander, which is specifically notable because that would have given her access to one of the main villains of Mass Effect and one of the youngest Turian Spectres, Saren. You see, Turians usually take the surnames of their respective sex parent, and in Vetra's case, her surname is Nyx which is also the name of the Greek deity who was literally born from chaos, or in our case, Vetra being born from Saren. On top of this, in the Mass Effect Revelations book, which takes place before the events of Mass Effect 1, we learn about Saren's descent into madness, where he went off the grid, which coincides exactly with the years Vetra claims her father left her. These implications would mean that we could potentially bang Saren's daughter in Mass Effect Andromeda, which would instantly make this game so much better for a lot of people. The next tier leads us into some stranger and less well-known theories in Mass Effect, ones that can fundamentally change how you view the games and their story. As most of you already know, the story of Andromeda centers around multiple massive ships called Arcs that have traveled all the way from the Milky Way galaxy to their neighboring Andromeda. It's later on in the main story of the game that we come to learn that the reason for this initiative in the first place was some sort of contingency plan, allowing most of the advanced races a way of survival should the Reapers succeed in their mission to exterminate all intelligent life in the Milky Way. It's a very cool, if not a little obvious reveal, but more importantly, it then begs the question, why was this not thought of before in previous Reaper extinction cycles? But you see, that's just the thing. We don't actually know that it wasn't. We can already see examples of previous cycles following the same path to extinction across multiple civilizations working on things like the Crucible. In fact, if anything, the Protheans in their timeline had managed to become even more advanced than the current one Shepard lies in, as they are the ones who finally broke the cycle of the Keepers initiating doom on the Citadel. When we start to think about it logically, it seems very likely over the countless cycles that other civilizations have tried to escape from our Milky Way prison. And if they were successful, then the even more intriguing thought of what happened to them becomes evident. The Angara and Ket in Andromeda bear striking resemblance to the Protheans in the original trilogy. Could they be descendants from a similar Prothean arc tens of thousands of years ago? And even more interestingly, could these arcs of other long lost aliens have found out more about the Reapers and the galaxy from far, far away? 
a potentially intriguing concept for a new Mass Effect to dive into. The Mass Effect universe is full of many interesting and lesser known species that we don't get to dive into as much detail as many of the council races. And one of the most obscure examples of this is the Ralloi. Introduced in the final installment of the original trilogy, the Ralloi are a tall bird-like alien species that hail from the planet Terves, which funnily enough we are never able to locate on the galaxy map throughout the series. Originally spotting an Asari cruiser over their home planet, the Ralloi eventually make contact and are introduced to the Citadel, where they were promptly fitted with high-tech spacesuits to protect other races from the avian flu that they promptly started spreading early on. Right as the Ralloi started having discussions with the Council though, they immediately fled, seeing the incoming Reaper invasion that happens at the start of Mass Effect 3 and all fled back to their homeworld, destroying their satellites and all high-level tech they had developed previously in a final gambit to hope the Reapers would leave them alone and not find them. This is because the Reapers, on their harvest every 50,000 years, only kill sufficiently intelligent organic species, so the Ralloi fled in an attempt to hide and lay low until the next cycle. As to whether the Reapers would have killed the Ralloi had Shepard not succeeded in stopping them, it's hard to say, but it does beg the question of whether any other previous civilizations had been fortunate enough to trick the Reapers. Considering that the Ralloi only just found the Citadel, it may in fact be possible. Either way though, it's sad we never get to see these beautiful bird people in game. Asari are a common fan favorite Mass Effect alien for reasons. But what if I told you that Asari don't actually look like this? You see, in a short conversation we can listen in on in Mass Effect 2 on Ilium, between a Salarian, Turian, and Human, we find out that each species actually sees Asari in their own image. This means that these human-like Asari that we see throughout Mass Effect only look like that because they are mimicking what our brains want to see. As we already know through encounters with Liara in the first game, and the Ardok Yashi Morinth in the second, Asari have a strong capability to control the minds of others, making us see and hear things that aren't really there. So this begs the question then, what do Asari actually look like? And could this also be why all Asari are seen as female? As females are commonly regarded as the fairer sex for most alien species in Mass Effect. These implications become scary when we realize that many of our original assumptions about the Asari race could actually just be clever manipulations by them to control us. We know that Asari children are always born Asari, regardless of what species they have mated with. So maybe the Asari are actually a parasitic race that is trying to feed on the galaxy by tricking other species into mating with them, ultimately to grow their influence. However, we do see some Asari statues at their temple in Thessia in Mass Effect 3, and these statues do in fact look like the human-like Asari we're used to, but this could just once again be more manipulation and tech even on the statues on their home planet. If these theories are true though, that would have some very damning consequences for characters we love like Liara, who may in fact be parasitic blood-sucking monsters out to take over the whole galaxy. Or I'm just crazy. For those paying very close attention to the original Andromeda marketing campaign, it became apparent early on that some of the promotional material had explosions that very closely resembled the explosion of the Citadel mass relay at the end of Mass Effect 3. We know this relay was much more powerful than others and even had the ability to transport the Reapers to and from dark space instantaneously. So when it exploded at the end of the trilogy, the resulting blast enveloping the entirety of the Milky Way was not too out of left field. However, the wormhole theory actually postulates that this explosion not only damaged or transformed the entire Milky Way galaxy, but actually ripped a hole in space-time itself and created a massive gravitational well that could have transported many inhabitants to the nearby Andromeda galaxy for which we see the explosion in the marketing material. To further support this, in the ending cutscene of Mass Effect 3, we actually see Joker and some of the Normandy squad surviving the Citadel explosion 
and crash landing on some sort of unknown planet in a jungle. Could this planet actually be the same overgrown jungle planet we see in Mass Effect Andromeda? We may never know for sure. The Rachni are one of the coolest creatures in all of Mass Effect. We originally encounter them in some sort of horror reveal on Novaria in Mass Effect 1. And throughout the series, especially in Mass Effect 3, they play a pivotal role in potentially helping you take down the Reapers. Over the entire series though, the Rachni always stayed shrouded in mystery somewhat, and we never truly find out about their origins, real motives, or entire history in the past. What we do know is that at some point the Rachni were a huge threat to the entire galaxy, prompting the Council to unleash the Krogan warriors on them to finally drive them to extinction. This is actually one of the main drivers for the start of the Genophage as well, as it empowered the Krogan to demand more say in Council politics. But as to where the Rachni even came from, we have no idea. An egg was found on a derelict ship that was revived at Novaria, and that is about all the info we get. This is where it gets really interesting though. You see, the Rachni Queen in Mass Effect 1 remarks about how her song has been soured, and this has resulted in a problem with her speaking to her children. We learn here that the Rachni Queens actually communicate and control the Horde through some sort of sound waves, and that something has caused this signal to sour. And interestingly, another being in the galaxy we know that responds to signals is actually the Keepers on the Citadel, who respond to the Reaper's signal to originally help them teleport through a mass relay on the Citadel. So could it be that the Rachni were being affected by this Reaper signal? And if they were, could this mean that they have some sort of connection to the Reapers? Maybe the Reapers were using them as some sort of help to keep the galaxy weak enough for their eventual arrival. This potentially got further clarification as well in the Mass Effect 3 Leviathan DLC, where it is implied by an Alliance scientist that the Rachni in fact may have been controlled by the Leviathans as a plan from them to stop the Reapers, and that the Reaper signal could have disrupted their control. Next up, our third tier thrusts us into some of the most obscure and interesting theories in all of Mass Effect that many players may not know about or are chilling to the core. The Thorian is one of the coolest moments in all of Mass Effect, something not uncommon for the first game. The creature is originally found near the Exogeny headquarters on Pharos, a planet you travel to in the first game in order to check out a Geth invasion that is happening there. After fighting through hordes of turn colonists that have mutated into some sort of zombie creature, you eventually find your way to the culprit, a massive space alien referred to as the Thorian. You learn that the Thorian has actually existed for an unimaginable amount of time, even before the Protheans, and that it holds the key known as a cipher to understand the Prothean beacon you unlocked earlier in the game. This is because the Thorian devours and obtains knowledge from its victims, as well as controlling them completely. And by devouring Protheans tens of thousands of years ago, it gained the same abilities that the Protheans once had. It's a cool concept on paper, but the craziest part about all of this is that we never see the Thorian again. We simply leave Pharos with our newfound knowledge, and for the rest of the series, that is the last we ever see of the Thorian at all. This is especially interesting because not only does this Thorian seem to have some sort of indoctrination ability akin to the Reapers and Leviathans, but it also starts to make us ask questions like how did the Thorian survive so many Reaper cycles and invasions? It's obviously a highly intelligent organic being, so shouldn't it already be wiped out? The only other major species we know of that survived this long is the Leviathans, but at least from them, we get some answers in the Mass Effect 3 DLC. For the Thorian, we never get anything. Which makes this mystery all the more interesting. Because even from just the short moment we have with this being in the first game, it's quite obvious that the Thorian is one of the most powerful creatures in all of Mass Effect, and that it may be hiding some very dark and sinister secrets that could further shed light on what is really happening in the Milky Way all this time. One of the coolest features of every Mass Effect game is the galaxy map. 
It allows players to not only traverse their way to new systems and planets, but also to simply read up on a lot of lore on the places we get to go. Most of the time this lore is pretty basic and uneventful filler that tells some basic background story of what's happening on this planet. But two specific planets in the series have a much more interesting background. The first one's from Mass Effect 3, called Ploba. Scans reveal that there is a baffling amount of strange and giant megastructures on the surface that are too regular in pattern to be explained away as standard geography. Many scientists have suggested that Ploba may in fact be a planet-sized supercomputer being housed in these megastructures, or a reaper hiding ground used to indoctrinate nearby species. Either way, we may never know. The next planet is Logan, from Mass Effect 1. Similar to Ploba, this gas giant was surveyed by scientist teams and it was discovered that several large and distinct objects were on the surface of the planet. However, even more horrifying in this case, the objects always immediately disappeared out of thin air when observed, and no answers or ideas have yet been brought forth as to what has happened with this phenomenon. Similar to the Ralloway, the virtual aliens are another species that we only hear very briefly about in Mass Effect 3. But this time, they have an even more horrifying and interesting backstory that is quite unique to the Mass Effect universe. You see, the virtual aliens, whose name we still do not know, hail from an unknown planet, either near the edge of the Milky Way or just outside of it, and they were facing a mass extinction event. The virtual alien's nearby sun was close to going supernova, and in order to preserve themselves and their future, they created a hyper-advanced and massive spaceship, where over one billion individuals uploaded their consciousness on board in order to preserve resources and ensure survival. The ship was controlled by artificial intelligence that eventually drove this massive freighter into Solarian space, where first contact was made. The Council swiftly decided to help the virtual aliens, whose ship was running low on power and they were on the verge of extinction because of it. To do so, 400 volunteers from Citadel Space were sent to the ship where they swapped their bodies to join into the Matrix-like computer simulation that all the virtual aliens were currently living in. In exchange, one virtual alien was able to take over every body for each of the hosts in the universe in order to communicate with the Council. The aliens express their desire to come back to the real world, but that is really where the story stops. And as to what lies in the future for the virtual aliens, we don't know. What we do know though, is that this is an amazing idea for a potential Mass Effect sequel, and meeting virtual aliens who have taken over host bodies after living in a simulation for their entire lives is the kind of story that we get so excited about in this universe. More than most things on this list, I really want to see where this story goes and I hope it gets expanded on in the future. The Keepers are one of the most mysterious beings that we meet in our entire time in the Mass Effect games. They're the strange little guys on the Citadel that keep it pristine and in good condition. And as we learn at the end of Mass Effect 1, they are also the ones who activate the Citadel Mass Relay to try and let the Reapers into Council space. In multiple games, we are also able to try and study the Keepers more, but find no answers. They are harboring a peculiar genetic makeup and seem not to respond in any way to others on the Citadel, simply working on tasks that sometimes seem unclear. One of the most damning scenes in the original trilogy, though, is actually something we see in the Shadow Broker DLC for Mass Effect 2. You see, after defeating the Shadow Broker and instilling Liara with her new duties as the galaxy's most well-involved benefactor, you get the chance to look through some of the old files that the Shadow Broker had that were classified as top secret and have huge lore implications. Some of these show scenes of espionage early in the previous games or big reveals for certain characters. But the most peculiar videotape we see is nothing more than a keeper locked away in a small room. So what is this keeper on the videotape hiding? Where is this facility? And what exactly is going on here? It's the only one of the videotapes that needs more explanation than simply what we see on screen. You see, these files and tapes are only for the most important and top secret things throughout the galaxy. 
So there must be more going on here than meets the eye. But this is all we got. And because of that, the mystery begins to get even bigger. Are there people that have discovered the true nature of the Keepers? And if they have, what does it all mean? Elitania is a planet we travel to in Mass Effect 1 after getting the mission UNC Lost Module, where Admiral Hackett informs us that an Alliance probe has gone missing on the planet's surface and we need to retrieve its data core. It seems like a pretty routine mission, and for the most part, it is. You land on the planet, fight some bad guys, and get your data core. What some players may have missed, though, is that Elitania is actually hiding a lot more than meets the eye. You see, when you first land on the planet, you are able to see an anomaly marked on your minimap, which, if tracked down, turns out to be a mysterious Prothean ruin. A large sphere suspended in air, surrounded by a structure of some sort. And after approaching the object and decrypting it, we are met with this text. Raising a hairy fist, you shake your spear at it in anger, and the creature rises up quickly until it disappears from view. With a satisfied grunt, you make your way back to your caves and the rest of your tribe. You fall into the familiar pattern of life. The hunt for food, the struggle to claim and keep a mate, the battles against other tribes that would claim your territory. Days roll into nights and back into days. Each time you rise from sleep, there is a sensation that you are not alone, that some other is with you, sharing all you see, hear, and feel. At these times, your hand goes to the strange lump on the back of your skull, and you remember the silver creature in the sky. The air grows colder, winter falls. You must range farther for food, clutching the furs tight against you to ward off the chill. It is on one of these long hunts that the strange bird returns. You hear it before you see it. It's call a deafening roar as it descends from above, swooping down onto you. A single great eye opens on the underbelly, a glowing red orb. You try to run, but a finger of red light extends from the eye and engulfs you, and all goes black again. You wake an instant later to find yourself on Elitania, lying on your back, the Prothean artifact looming above you undamaged and your companions standing over you. They help you to your feet, puzzled. There was a flash of light and you just sort of toppled over, one explains. Are you okay, Shepard? The other asks. You don't answer right away, wondering at the implications of what you have seen. The memories of a Cro-Magnon hunter, captured by an implanted Prothean data recorder. How long did they study the primitive humans? observing them and analyzing the results at their base on Mars. And what, if anything, did they leave for us? The vision Shepard has shows that the Protheans were in fact watching us even as primates, and they were not destroyed in their cycle because we had not become sufficiently intelligent enough as a species. In fact, that red light seen in the vision may actually have been our first encounter with a Reaper ever and foreshadows our doom later in the series, before we even know what is going on. An awesome revelation that many fans of the series probably completely missed. Finally, our last tier gives us a glimpse into the most maddening and horrifying theories in all of Mass Effect. The theories that can entirely change our perception of its universe, its characters, and its meaning. It's well known by now that many fans didn't like the ending of the original Mass Effect trilogy. All of the decisions we made and relationships we formed didn't matter in the end. Instead, it all came down to three choices. Red, blue, green. For people like me, the green ending was the best. I already did a video about that. But more importantly, maybe this ending was actually what made the most sense for the series as a whole. You see, at the end of Mass Effect 3, the Crucible has finished construction, and Shepard is able to use it to destroy all synthetic life, organic life, or combine us into a new being entirely. Right before the choice though, we are met with a catalyst. A mirage of a boy Shepard has been seeing throughout the game in his nightmares that tells us it is an artificial intelligence that controls the Reapers. The Catalyst is the mastermind behind the cycles of destruction and was created by the Leviathans to protect them before it turned against them. 
as it saw this betrayal as the only way to actually preserve all organic life. The Catalyst argues that all organic life eventually makes synthetics, artificial intelligence, in order to improve their lives. But it is through this very process of improvement that these synthetics must eventually become more capable than their creators, which inevitably leads to destruction and chaos, as we have already seen turned proof multiple times in this series. This gets even more intriguing though when we ask the Catalyst about the Crucible. The Mastermind is very knowledgeable about what it is, what it does, and how it works. But when we ask further, we simply are told it's too complicated to delve into for now. For a mastermind and evil AI, this seems fishy to not give full context where before we were given absolute certainty on all our answers. And maybe this is for a reason. Because maybe the Crucible wasn't something the organics over multiple cycles created to finally stop the Reapers. In fact, maybe it was actually just another trick from the Catalyst. You see, the Catalyst Prime Directive, the reason it was created in the first place was to protect organic life at all costs. And as far as we know, this is still the intelligence's main goal today. So what if the plans for the Crucible were actually left by the Catalyst? What if the Catalyst realized that the only way to save organics from their own destruction was to eventually have them join together with synthetics as one. The crucible isn't our salvation, it's a test. A test to see if organisms over millions of years of cycles of destruction at the hands of the reapers can finally ascend into something bigger than themselves. It would perfectly explain these cycles from the reapers. It was all actually a sort of trial to force organics down the path to synthesis, the green ending. Shepard is nothing more than the final conclusion of these cycles, the hero of his time that hopefully, from the Catalyst's perspective, is finally ready to make the correct decision, the synthesis ending to join all organic and synthetic life. And it is in this final moment that the Catalyst gives full control back to its creators to make that decision. After all, only if Shepard actually chooses the synthesis ending does it indicate through all the Catalyst's work that organics are finally ready to ascend and remove themselves from the shackles of doom that bind them. It explains the weird dreamlike sequences in the ending, and also explains why no Reapers are directed to stop Shepard at the Catalyst, as there are many flying by at the time. The Catalyst allows this to happen because this was the plan all along. It's planned to do what it was originally created to do. Save all organic life at any cost. Piggybacking off the idea of the Catalyst and the Crucible, we actually hear about these beings even earlier on in the story. A small tidbit many fans don't know about. As early as in Mass Effect 1, players can find a codex entry on a planet called Clencori which is owned by a Volus billionaire named Kuman Shoal. The Codex entry explains that Shoal was shown a vision of higher beings made of light on his planet that explained to him that the other lost crypts of beings of light were on the planet and that they were created to protect organic life at all costs against the synthetic machine devils. The reason this entry is so weird is because at first glance it seems to be referring to the same beings that the Catalyst is, the supposed artificial intelligence that was created by the Leviathans that created the Reapers. But if that is the case, why did these beings of light tell Shoal that they are trying to protect us from the machine devils? Could this be further proof that the Catalyst is in fact the good guy of the main story, and that Synthesis is the correct ending? Maybe these beings of light, the Catalyst is in fact ultimately trying to defend humanity against the Reapers, and is merely using them as a tool for our, our salvation. If that is not the case, then this mystery becomes even weirder, as it would imply that there are more Catalyst-like creatures that are pulling the strings behind the Mass Effect universe at all times, almost like the gods of ancient Greece and Rome. One theory I have as well is that this could potentially have been the original idea for the main story, but later on Bioware reworked 
the idea for beings of light into the catalyst ending. Either way, it's cool to see from this theory that some of the other previous ones on this list match up and how much planning and foresight went into creating this amazing universe, even from just the onset of the first game. The indoctrination theory might actually be the most well-known theory in all of Mass Effect. It originally gained popularity after a YouTuber released his theory video almost a decade after the conclusion of Mass Effect 3. It argues that at some point either in Mass Effect 3, towards the end of the first game, or after Shepard's death in the second, our player character has actually become indoctrinated by the Reaper's powers. This explains why the ending sequence of Mass Effect 3 is so strange. Many players notice that the entire last fight sequence fighting a Reaper taking on the elusive man, and eventually talking to the Catalyst at the Crucible seems very out of place and almost dreamlike. It could be that at this point Shepard has become fully indoctrinated by the Reapers and Catalyst power and is simply imagining things or speaking directly to the Catalyst through his subconscious. We have seen multiple characters throughout the story of Mass Effect that were taken over by the powers of indoctrination most notably Saren in the first game, but even many side characters as well. Mind control is a key talking point of the Mass Effect franchise, and the indoctrination theory ties perfectly into this. It could fit into the Crucible and Synthesis endings, as it could potentially imply that the Catalyst has started to mind control Shepard into making the correct choice. It could also mean, as the theory originally states, that the Reapers and Catalyst are actually trying to indoctrinate Shepard into choosing something like Synthesis instead of Destruction. But I buy very little into this, as the Catalyst could have simply sent the Reapers to stop Shepard on the Crucible, as well as a multitude of other reasons, like the Destruction ending actually making no sense in the first place. Destroying the Reapers accomplishes nothing as a future organic civilization would eventually create artificial intelligence that turns against them again and again, as we have already seen repeated in endless cycles. Also, another fun fact is the indoctrination theory could potentially explain the Paragon and Renegade system throughout the series. The reason Shepard is able to influence so many people and events in the universe is because he is in fact indoctrinated by the Reapers, and thus has some of their powers of influence. Even more interestingly, if we take this theory to its limits, it is also possible that Shepard is not being indoctrinated by the Reapers or the Catalyst, but rather by the Leviathans or Thorian instead, as he has had an encounter with both and we know both have the ability to mind control subjects just like the Reapers. Either way, it seems quite clear that there is a very high likelihood that Shepard's decisions at the end of the Mass Effect trilogy may not actually be his very own. Yet another theory that potentially ties all of these grand theories of Mass Effect together is the Dark Energy Theory. This theory postulates that Tally's loyalty mission in Mass Effect 2 is actually a warning of the real danger in the Milky Way the one the Reapers and the Catalyst are trying to protect us from. In the mission, it is heavily implied that the dying star Hailstrom was actually so close to going supernova because of the events of dark energy causing it to go to extremely fast heat death. In fact, one of the main writers, Drew Kapison at Bioware and some of his team members who have left Bioware, have actually heavily implied that this was originally the plan for the ending of Mass Effect a reveal that the Reapers were killing civilization every 50,000 years in order to stall and find a way to stop this spread of dark energy from large Mass Effect fields and Ezo. If this were in fact true, that would mean the Reapers are truly the good guys of the original trilogy, and that they were simply trying to find a way to save all organic life from their inevitable death at the hands of dark energy swallowing our universe whole. And this brings us to the final theory on my list, and potentially also the most interesting. One that not only ties everything we have talked about together, but also the theory of what the next Mass Effect game will be about. I actually already made a video about this a long long time ago, 
but I want to briefly touch on and elaborate more on this idea. You see, currently we have no idea where the next Mass Effect game is going, but I have a theory that I hope becomes true, because it would tie everything together so perfectly. You see, what if the Catalyst and the Reapers, like we've been speaking about, were the good guys? What if they were truly trying to protect all organic life, as they were originally created to do? What if there was dark energy close to destroying life as we know it? And what if the Reaper cycle was ultimately building towards humanity choosing synthesis and combining with synthetics to become a new and all-powerful being that could solve this issue? And what if, as implied in the Mass Effect Next trailer, the actual decision Shepard chose was destruction, the red ending? In the trailer, we see multiple destroyed mass relays, and even a dead reaper and derelict reaper on an icy planet. So what if Shepard made a mistake and chose destruction, thus ruining the plan set forth by the reapers to save us? This would open up the potential for a new game, where we slowly discovered that Shepard made this grave mistake, our hero and that our biggest threat all along was this dark energy that was only alluded to in the second game briefly. A plot point that the Mass Effect team, we know for a fact, had originally intended to include. The game could open with us in a galaxy that has been rebuilt after the destruction of all synthetics. Some fringe groups would be outlawed from Alliance space because of work on new AI systems, and there would be multiple new races that have now had the time to develop after the Reapers' failed invasion. The main story could center around a new character, or Shepard Reborn, slowly uncovering this true threat in the galaxy and finding a way to stop it. This could even tie into Andromeda and the Scourge, you see, in Andromeda, there was a strange mythical substance that was taking over entire planets and killing them, called the Scourge, and we never really learn what that actually is. Could it be that the Scourge is really dark energy? Could it be Andromeda was a warning to all of us what the true villain of the series was? This would imply that dark energy was not only potentially dooming the Milky Way, but all galaxies and the entire universe with it. What if the next Mass Effect game told the story of the Milky Way being rebuilt, of new and fantastical stories and races to discover, and of the discovery that Shepard was wrong, that our hero was actually the biggest villain, and that we must now figure out how to stop the Scourge, the dark energy, from killing us all? This journey could take us to the edges of the Milky Way into dark space, where we could potentially find that arc that was lost in Andromeda and never found. It could lead us to finding still alive reapers drifting derelict in dark space. And it could eventually lead us to finding a solution with the help of our sworn enemies to save not just the Milky Way this time, but the entire galaxy as we know it. Mass Effect is one of my most beloved franchises of all time, and it's easy to see why. The universe is so rich with intrigue and lore, and the characters we meet and moments we have with them will live on with us forever, as well as the many questions that this series leaves us with. I'm excited for the next Mass Effect not because of next-gen graphics, better gameplay, or a new cast of characters but because we finally get to dive into this amazingly deep and interesting world that has so many more stories to be told and conspiracies to be had. As always, thanks for watching and supporting the channel. It really does mean a lot. And let me know down below what theories you guys really like from Mass Effect that I didn't include and what you're interested in to see from me next, potentially in another iceberg conspiracy theory video. I really do enjoy doing these for you guys. They do take a lot of time though, but as always, thank you.